I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode. This episode I'm joined by three guests. Louise Morton, who heads up the horticultural programme at Wicker Primary School, and two of the mini horts themselves, Rebecca and Kieran. Louise set up a horticultural programme at the school 11 years ago, initially in a voluntary capacity. The programme became such a success, she's now employed by the school and works four days a week to deliver what has become a vital part of the curriculum. Rebecca and Kieran are Year 6 pupils who are members of the After School Gardening Club and leads in the mini horts programme passing on their knowledge and enthusiasm to younger pupils. The mini horts have been in the media quite a bit, including featuring in an episode of Gardener's World in 2017, so they're seasoned pros at this sort of thing. If you don't have children or children of school age, I think you'll still find this episode interesting and inspiring, so give it a go. It's well worth a listen. I started out by asking Louise about her role within the mini horts. So I'm the horticulturist employed to educate pupils, design, tend and landscape areas of our two acre living library and what made you start mini horts was it was it actually something that you founded uh mini horts is the word that i gave to all of our gardeners at school all 436 pupils around about seven years ago we have been gardening here for over 10 but wanted to really give a recognized name for the gardeners here at wicker so that people could recognize the work they do did you start out being employed or was it a voluntary thing at first so I was actually a volunteer here. There was a blank canvas with the vision of the head teacher, myself and um, a science lead here, Alison Nash. We all together um, plotted um, how we wanted the gardens to develop and set to work about landscaping with other members of um, the team, namely our volunteers now. And over the time, um, as the need became greater to maintain the gardens it was recognised that an employed role would be needed and so I was very fortunate with the vision of the head teacher Mark Wildman to be employed here at Wicker gradually increasing my hours as the the grounds developed. Fantastic and did you work with any of the pupils on the design of the garden did they get involved? The pupils are key to all of the design of the gardens it's their need via the curriculum and um, how we can and um, take their journeys with their imaginations into the garden and also about the requirements for making it accessible for the children as well they've enjoyed every moment so maybe I could ask this of um, Rebecca what um, are your kind of particular interests within the site what's your favorite bit of the garden I think my favourite bit of the garden, it, it, I'd have to say the orchard because we have all the apple trees and you can see all different kinds of plants and there's all kinds of wonderful things to see there and we often get an opportunity to plant trees there in mini halls. So I, I, really, I just really like the orchard. Brilliant. Do you um, sell any of the produce that comes out of it or do you use it in the school? We do sell veg boxes with um, all sorts of things. We sell rhubarb and other vegetables and fruits. And it, it's a very good experience. Fantastic. Um, so I suppose this is a question that could that could be relevant to all of you, really. So please jump in um, as you see fit. But um, one of the objections that I've heard to school gardens is, is that they're hard work, which anyone who's got a garden will will understand that is the case. Um, And quite often they do rely on volunteers. um, And the problem can be that over the school holidays, they might not necessarily get tended to. How do you overcome that problem? Well, Miss Morton, some of the volunteers, they have um, stayed in over the half terms to water and look after the plants. During the British weather, it's quite rainy anyway. So all they've got to do really is put some fertiliser in them sometimes. But we have to overcome the struggle by help getting all the children involved and, um, yeah, just making sure they have an interest in it. Kieran recognises that, you know, there's a need to maintain the garden because um, where the children are invested in learning about nature, it's not a case of just planting it, a seed and leaving it to grow. Actually, we need to feed and nurture and water and that's exactly what we do do here at Wicker. The volunteers are fantastic. Um, we have a team of volunteers who come in and take on the social and therapeutics aspect of, of horticulture and they come and pass on skills to the children. 
essentially my role is to keep the gardens growing well during all summer holidays we run our veg box scheme all through the summer holidays so the local community can come in and buy veg boxes for five pounds each with surprise items seasonally and the money goes back into um funding resources such as seeds and tools Mm. so do any of the children come in over the holidays they absolutely do. Some of the children come in and harvest veg boxes with their parents. So they get to come and harvest some of the vegetables they've grown. We also get um, children who have left Wicker and have gone on to secondary school who come back and they actually garden within the school holidays. They garden as part of their work experience as well, which is charming. And do you find that, that people actually take the ideas that they've learned in the school garden and then use them in their own gardens at home? Absolutely. One of the most exciting things we've had here is where children go home and they start to tell their parents how to garden. Gardening is often known to have skipped a generation more recently. And so children nowadays are going back and actually teaching their parents things they don't know. So they're growing together. Yeah, that's very true. I always think that perhaps the the, the last generation, actually the ones that, that dipped out on the connection to gardening. So so that's really amazing. Um, and you sound as if you are very, you're, this is a very serious project, I think. And um, I wonder if you've got any measurable positive impacts that have come as a result of this. Do you, do you actually produce kind of research that is really beneficial in terms of guiding maybe future strategy when it comes to putting horticulture on the um, curriculum? Well, we have been approached by the RHS um, to comment on how impactful that gardening has been here in horticulture within our um, school. Um, it is hard to measure. We're really happy to feed back to anybody who's interested in our, you know, 11 years worth of experience. Um, so really happy to, you know, contribute, particularly looking at the fact that now GCSE is um, being made, um, you know, within um, the subject of the natural history they're looking at implementing that and I think gardening plays a key part of it our children here are really really um, well so passionate about wildlife and that is the connectivity between wildlife and gardening as well and um, a recent sort of plea from David Attenborough for more people to be gardening for the planet you know as mentioned in things like gardeners world and that's something that we are really really passionate about doing is improving biodiversity as a whole and if people would like to see how we have improved biodiversity in our site we'd be happy to comment and and share some of our findings yeah that would be amazing where could people reach out to you to do that so they can connect to us and um, directly through our school office if they want to message and contact uh, Louise Morton at Wicker and likewise our head teacher Mark Wildman. We'd be happy to, to um, be in contact with anybody who'd like to come and have a look at our grounds as well. Wow. Oh, that's lovely. Brilliant. Um, so is horticulture on the curriculum in UK schools at the moment or is it just part of that? Um, I can't remember what you called it. Natural is natural environment. It, yes, and that's a natural history. Um, essentially, horticulture is not listed on curriculums in UK schools. However, this, our um, unique point at Wicca is that we have um, written a bespoke curriculum piece um, integrated into our science curriculum, which has natural history and horticulture. So it allows our children to learn about both subjects. And I mean, it, all schools, um, it is achievable. Gardening can be adapted to deliver all aspects of the primary curriculum. It doesn't need to be um, sectioned into purely gardening. I think that's where some people are a little afraid to, to, to try different things, maybe because of resources, as you've mentioned, because of funding and also because of um, start, you know, staff shortages. Essentially, um, it does take um, more adults perhaps to go outside and learn. Yeah, I imagine it is quite, it, as I say, the people that I've spoken to anecdotally have said that it's just a very difficult thing to manage. Um, there is a lot of work involved and I think that's a barrier for a lot of people. So would you do you think maybe the key is to get in, well, A, the support of the management team within the school, but also getting the support of maybe the local community and the parents and the pupils and everybody else to make sure that it's a collaboration? 
It definitely it needs to be a whole school approach, starting as ours has with the vision of the head teacher. You need to have the management structure on board. Then you also have to have somebody um, who has the time dedicated as uh, you know, I have been employed to actually run the facility. So it might be, you know, a few hours a week. It might be a full time role. And then also uh, the teachers who are uh, allowed that time to um, weave in the gardening aspect of the curriculum. And also, um, absolutely, all the children need to invest in it. It's their environment showing the care um, and also investing in their well-being. In addition, community involvement can be achieved, can be a bit daunting for people, but it can be done. And I think that the key is to start small, grow big. Don't think too much beyond what's in front of you at the time. Apart from the VegBox scheme, is it something that you think you need external funding for? As you mentioned when we when, when we first spoke, you are a state school and there essentially is no budget for this. So how how do you fund it? Uh, so we we started as most schools should look at it with um you know a small plot it could be a meter square raised bed it could be pots you can do this in a concrete ground um but we have essentially been lucky enough to have large ground so we can nibble away but um we we're now at a stage where we do rely on um still support from a very supportive local gardening center who give us um recycled pots if we need them uh, split bags of compost. We do enter as many competitions as we can so we can put money back in. But we are also self-funding in the fact that we have um, developed products as well. We have our own botanical soap. So funds from that profit go back into the school gardens. We have our own tea. We have um, also the veg box sales as well. So we're, we're, putting, we're developing and the money is going back into the pot. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. That's really great. Um, so Rebecca and Kieran, has it changed the way that you think about your future careers? Is this something that you might look into now as a viable career option? Definitely. Yeah, it would be a very enjoyable career and it would be positive for the planet and it would be very good for mental health. And yeah, I'd definitely look into it. Um, same here. I'll definitely uh, look into it. I was thinking of being an IT manager, but having a look on the outcome of our world at the minute, the ozone layer is breaking and climate change is just coming to a really bad rate at the minute. So garden could actually save the whole world. What do you think are the most important aspects of the garden? Do you think it's growing food and being able to feed yourself or do you think it's how it works with wildlife or do you think it's both? I think it's both because wildlife is really good because, like, we need places for all our wildlife to live. Like, birds, they're coming down at a fast rate as well. But as long as we have, like, a pod that we do that we're really lucky to have, so we have, like, frogs and all that, but then that's when the birds can come in and feed on the worms at the allotment and we have a compost area. So we're, I think we're really lucky to have the facilities. Hmm, you definitely are. And what's some of the most exciting things that you get coming into the garden in the way of wildlife? Um, in, well, we see a lot of beetles um during the gardening year, and we we have a lot of mint. That's why we make soaps and teas with it, and it that does attract beetles and other insects and um birds and other animals. It definitely does encourage the wildlife. And I imagine that the garden is something that could feed into other, other subjects. So do you use the garden when you're learning about maybe science or, or even art? Oh, yeah. We come into the allotment when we do science because we have a lot of environmental science. And it's a very good place to sort of observe how plants survive and grow and how animals live off them and it's a very good observe area to observe um the life cycle i have to ask what's your favorite thing to grow oh my favorite thing to grow is probably the strawberries because they're really nice once you get them off the bush they're really good yeah how do you keep the mice off of them don't we don't really have mice <laughs> you're <no>. lucky <laughs> i have to share mine with the mice <laughs> Um, so, Louise, if anybody was thinking about setting up a programme that is similar, 
Do you, where do you think they could go? Obviously, they can approach you. Are there any other resources that might be helpful? Um, absolutely. The RHS are leading in um, plans and resources on their fantastic website. So I would definitely use that as a starting point. They're there to hold your hand at each step of weaving in um, science lessons with gardening and they are just fantastic but also connectivity with other people can be really inspiring going to visit other gardens and see that actually gardening is something which is beneficial for so many other things and it can be achieved quite easily it's just about starting small growing big how much space do you need for this kind of project so um One thing that inspired my journey in school garden was that I had a school concrete playground and I used to look at the trees and I used to look at the weeds that grew within the cracks of the grounds. And actually, inner city schools can be inspired by growing pots and meter raised beds. Okay, the size might be smaller, but the values are still there. Growing plants, being in the fresh air and actually seeing the wildlife that visits those plants and It needn't be expensive. It could be done with recycled materials, free seeds on the front of um, packets which are donated and it can be achieved. It's just about managing it and planning it and having that vision of a head teacher to enable it. Yeah. So, Rebecca and Kieran, is there anything that you're particularly concentrating on at the moment in the garden? We, We really are thinking about how there is a decline in our insects and how that doesn't attract as many other animals as well because certain insects we used to see aren't as common anymore that so it really is something we do focus on Mm. are you looking at anything in particular just beetles generally oh okay and what do you do to encourage those in um we generally try and plant plants that do attract insects as well as bees and um, worms we like butterflies and basically we just try and plant plants which are very good for insects Mm. yeah so essentially and the year six children are holding a wildlife for gardening fair where all year groups are growing plants which are designed to attract different species of wildlife so butterflies bees grasshoppers crickets dragonflies damselflies so it's a whole six months worth of growing units which will come to a a head in june where we invite entomologists in to work with the children and share that event with the local community and actually out of interest going back to the whole careers thing about obviously horticulture is is um is having a bit of a low moment uh in terms of its profile as a potential career have you noticed any children being more interested in horticulture as a career as a result of having the garden absolutely um as i say we have former pupils who come back to wicca to garden with us weekly and they are so passionate that they are um using their work experience time here and they're also going to visit local um, centres such as Sparsholt as progressing after they leave and finish their GCSEs. So we are definitely are the proof that it is working, that it is inspiring children. We've had great support from the RHS as well, enabling children to go and have work experience with them. And that's been really, really powerful, saying it can be achieved. Have you had any um, unexpected benefits from having the garden unexpected benefits have definitely been within the community changing touching lives therapeutic horticulture here was something that we wanted to encourage but never expected to have such a direct impact to the local community and also setting an example for children seeing people give their own time and energy to come here and pass on skills which are often being lost and actually connecting people who would be maybe isolated lonely and increasing their health by enabling them to um, be active outside in the fresh air has been breathtaking here absolutely stunning to watch and stunning to be a part of for the children and the adults alike yeah it's such a good thing I mean you know I can't speak highly enough of it but um I wondered actually to finish whether um you could each maybe share one or two particularly uplifting or poignant or heartwarming experiences that you've had whilst you've been involved in the project um I I I don't have a particularly 
brilliant moment but the whole thing's just really incredible because you get to socialize with other people you get to grow plants you get to see what comes out of it it's an educational process as well I, I, it's, it's just all incredible really and Kevin? Um, well I had this one very particular moment where we were doing gardening world and they asked us like what do you think about mint? And I said, I like mint because it has a nice smell to it. So now all my friends call me Mint Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, there's much worse nicknames. So, yeah, I'd be happy yeah. with that. <laughs> <laughs> mint, mint Boy, as seen on Gardener's World. Um, <laughs> <He's famous. laughs> he is. Um, and I think that, again, mine comes back down to um, children who have never seen things like frogs, um, squirrels, never seen... Um, particular wildlife in their own habitat that has got to be uplifting for anybody to share that moment with children but also with the community we had somebody who was very very unwell and um after he had passed he had been here to garden with us for uh, several months in that time and his wife wrote to say how that had made the last few months of his life so special and that's something we would hold so dearly that this has happened that we can facilitate this at Wicker people making a difference yeah that's lovely I mean you are it sounds as if you're so lucky um especially to have the community involved that's just that's that's really quite magical um and it's I think it's maybe something that a lot of schools don't have that connection because they're not doing anything that can involve people necessarily to to come through the gates and spend time on the site Absolutely. And it, it obviously everybody is um, DBS checked and um, people in days gone by would come in and read with children. Why shouldn't they garden with children? Why shouldn't they be passing on skills? It's not just about being within the classroom, it's being outside of the classroom. And the art of conversation, which is being so readily lost with computers and screens, is enabled within the school garden for children to talk and have conversations. Again, the skills are and you know, resources are, are endless out here. So it's it's just a fantastic opportunity. Well, a very big thank you to Louise and a very special thanks to Rebecca and Kieran for taking time out of their day to speak so enthusiastically and professionally about their garden and what it means to them. I've been meaning to speak to Louise for a long time and I'm glad we finally managed to catch up. And what's interesting is that I didn't realise how much work they're doing at the school into the link between gardens and the natural environment, which ties in beautifully and synchronistically with the direction that many previous guests have been moving into. I'm thinking specifically about the episodes with Kate Bradbury, Dave Gawson, Benjamin Vogt, John Little and Fergus Garrett. So do go and take a listen to those if this is something you're interested in. It sometimes feels like it's an uphill battle to wake the world up to the importance of these issues, but if we take Wicker Primary as an example... It sounds very much as if they're already exploring the area where ornamental gardening and the natural sciences overlap. If this kind of project can be rolled out to more schools, if horticulture and specifically this broader and more encompassing type of horticulture that's practised at Wicker could become commonplace in our schools, just think how many young environmentalists will become garden owners and garden stewards in a few years' time. Rebecca and Kieran may or may not go on to work in horticulture, but they will always carry the knowledge and the love of the natural world with them that they learnt at school. And honestly, that gives me a lot of faith in the future. So thanks to you for listening. Don't forget, if you are enjoying the podcast, please leave me a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. It does help get it out to other people who might be interested. I'll catch you next Tuesday. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk follow me on twitter roots and all facebook roots and all uk and instagram roots and all pod But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All. Roots and All.